We have this current exhibition, Common Struggle, Individual Experience, an exhibition about mental health presented by Hartford Healthcare Institute of Living, and it's on exhibit until October 16th. And for this exhibition, we consulted with mental health scholars, mental health professionals, and community focus groups. And today's Lunch and Learn presenter, Professor Cornelia Dayton, was a member of the Exhibition Advisory Board. Cornelia Dayton is a professor of history at the University of Connecticut, and she is currently researching mental health sufferers in New England until 1840, emphasizing people's life stories and the fault lines of race, gender, and social status. Her publications include Women Before the Bar, Gender, Law, and Society in Connecticut, 1639 to 1789, Robert Love's Warnings, Searching for Strangers in Colonial Boston with Sharon V. Salinger, and a recent New England Quarterly article, Lost Years Recovered, John Peters and Phyllis Wheatley Peters in Middleton. So we are so pleased that you are here today, Professor Dayton, and looking forward to your research on Euro-American settlers and mental health. So please welcome and get started. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, proceed that way. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a great discussion. I just have to get it into the beginning here. There we go. Uh, well, as Jen said, and thanks to the CHS for um, asking me to speak today, but also um, I really highly recommend their wonderful exhibit, which is up through October of this year. Um, but there's also a virtual tour of the exhibit too that you can take. So I put the link to that at the end of, of my talk today. Um, but as Jen said, I'm working on a book about family and community responses to uh, mental health challenges. Um, and the project's focus is really the late colonial, the late 17th century um, to the 1830s. Um, thus, I am investigating beliefs and, and practices uh, before the founding of asylums or uh, retreats. And I've put pictures of the first two uh, large um, purpose-built uh, asylums on the slide. Um, the, color, the one in color is of uh, McLean, the McLean Asylum um, in 1845 when its campus had expanded a bit after its opening 20 years before or so. And you may recognize the picture on the upper right in black and white, which is of the Hartford Retreat, uh, later called the Hartford Institute of Living. But we're not going to talk about those institutions today. We're going to focus on how did New Englanders cope um, with mental health crises and issues before there the rise of psychiatry, before there were asylums. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in the period before the 1830s, there were a few, a handful of physicians in New England who took um, seriously afflicted patients into their homes um, for care. But again, uh, that was extremely rare. And that meant that 99% of people suffering from some sort of uh, mental health crisis uh, were cared for at home or, or in their community. And that, those patterns of care are the subject of my research. So over the years of researching this, I, I have um, found about just under 3,000 um, people in the period of my study um, described in one record or another as mentally troubled or incapacitated in some way in terms of cognitive reasoning. And to do that, I've canvassed many sources, but not all of them that exist. Uh, so that would include diaries, family letters, newspaper stories, court cases involving um, mental health issues, uh, and conservatorships. I've done this systematically for some counties, like New Haven County and New London County in Connecticut, Essex County in Massachusetts, Rockingham County in New Hampshire, but I have by no means identified all uh, recorded instances. Um, but I think I've been done this more systematically than any other scholar. And nearly all the persons in my study could be called uh, ordinary people. There are a few famous people who appear, like James Otis, uh, the Massachusetts resident and famous revolutionary period firebrand and lawyer who tragically suffered a, a mental breakdown in Boston in 1770. 
um, and died 13 years later in Andover, um, Massachusetts, where he was cared for on a farm owned by a doctor who specialized in treating people with um, mental difficulties. Um, and he was placed there for care and, and for his safety. I certainly chronicle in my book how wealthy and, uh, and priv privileged families widen, use their resources to widen their options, such as giving their children um, who were troubled in some way, special tailored education, um, or wealthy families could hire aides, watchers, um, scribes, uh, et cetera. Um, but the great majority of those in my study are not elites. Um, and so my investigation shed what we might call new light on the struggles and coping mechanisms of ordinary people on a day-to-day -day level. So if we think about mental challenges, mental health challenges from the perspective of the town, and we think about small and medium-sized towns in Connecticut, um, not the big towns, um, my research shows that in most towns in the long span of years that I'm studying, somewhere between 10 and 25 uh, residents were at some point um, observed to suffer from mental intense mental distress or cognitive impairment. Um, and at this town level, the available sources include suicide inquests, conservatorships, which we'll get back to today, death records, diaries, genealogist notes, uh, and family papers. So there, there would be a story there. I could take a town um, and discuss um, the range of the, the people who live there and, and their struggles. I'm not going to do that today, but one, one could do that. But here's what I found about the standard responses um, by white New Englanders um, to persons who manifested mental and cognitive disabilities. Um, and the first thing we'd say is that the steps taken to ascertain their distress and to care for them were communal. Uh, they, they were undertaken by lay people, not professionals, um, and typically doctors were not involved. Secondly, the site for caregiving uh, was the home or one's lodgings. Thirdly, and this is really important, um, English settlers uh, saw mental affliction as involuntary. Um, it meant it was not something you brought on yourself. And people often ask me about what was the overlap between witchcraft or people targeted as witches in this period and um, mental illness as either they understood it or we understand it. And I would say there's very little overlap because these early settlers understood witchcraft as a voluntary action, something that you took um, knowingly and wittingly, um, and you were very blamed for choosing to side in effect with the Satan uh, and not with God. So <clears throat> the fact that they understood someone being uh, mentally troubled as an involuntary state is important. And then finally, um, I identify the chief emotion expressed by white New Englanders towards white people who suffered from mental trouble as sympathy or Christian compassion. Um, and I really think their Christian ethics uh, deeply informed what you'll see, I argue, is their patience, their forbearance, um, and their belief that someone will probably get better. <clears throat> And the phrase that um, some of them use sometimes is there, but for the grace of God, go I. Uh, and you can see that New Englanders thought this, this state might befall me someday um, and I need to help my fellow um, uh, householder. There's some more features that we could talk about that are related. Um, in most cases, people who lived in England and the British colonies in this time period and were European in background, expected that um, their mental health crisis, when, it when their mental health state changed, would, would be an episode or would be episodic, would come in spells. Um, and their default assumption was that the person's reason, which they thought the person had lost partially or, or fully, would be restored in time might be a day, it might be a week, it might be longer. 
Uh, and this is important for us to think about because they did not seem to equate um, mental illness with a lifelong condition. They knew, of course, that for some people it became chronic, um, but that was a fairly small percentage they felt. So their initial reflexes were to, to expect that the person's uh, reasoning, their former personality, et cetera, would return. And we can see in their language that they thought about um, this state as coming in gradations. Someone might perfectly lose their reason, meaning wholly, but often it was somewhat, it was partial. Uh, and the last feature that I'll mention for now is that physical restraint uh, was used very sparingly in this time period. So the next slide is really about what categories did people ha have recourse to? What language did they use? Um, and, and it is true in this period that um, New Englanders thought about broad types of, of mental trouble um, and two that often come up are melancholia, melancholy kind of maps onto our understanding of depression um, and then mania um, <clears throat> or that might map onto psychosis for us um, or, or breakdowns or they sometimes describe someone as raving which suggested mania. Um, but I think the point to make really is that psychology had not emerged as a field um, and 18th century and early 19th century folk did not have more elaborated terms than these, more specialized terms. They didn't have a whole range of diagnostic uh, labels. Uh, tellingly, both in England and in um, the North America at this time, people tended to use adjectives to describe someone in one of these states, not nouns. I find in New England records that the nouns lunatic and, and maniac only start to appear um, after 1800 outside of formal legal documents. There's a wonderful medical historian, Roy Porter of England, um, who notes that this adjectival orientation of lay speech um, indicates that, as he puts it, madness was conceived more in terms of deeds and demeanor than a permanent internal disposition. And we might say that this use of adjectives in the, the, the 18th century parallels somewhat with today's first person movement, um, which recommends we use descriptors such as a person with schizophrenia or a youth on the autism spectrum. Uh, and then finally, uh, the most common adjective used in 18th century New England was distracted. Now that sounds funny to us because we talk about ourselves as distracted in a much more informal uh, way. But I, I need to remind us that the colonists used this almost always with a very sober, compassionate tone. Sometimes they commented that they were sad and it hurt their feelings to see someone who had, as they put it, fallen into distraction. They drew on one dictionary meaning of the word, indicating that someone or something was out of frame. If we looked it up in the OED, we would find this meaning dismembered, not contained within proper bounds. And I think that is the major metaphor that white New Englanders brought to uh, <clears throat> this idea, that a distracted person was separated from his or her wits or senses. And maybe we can see that in the list I put together for you of vernacular phrases that, that were, were often used in this time period. Um, and just take, take a minute maybe to um, see what your impressions are of these phrases, whether some of them are still in use. <clears throat> and I'm just interested in what you make of the spatial metaphors here. You could put your ideas into chat if you'd like to, and we can come back to them later. Uh, the, the second point I'll make here while well, these slides, this slide is still up, is that it was really only after 1800 
<clears throat> as far as I can tell, um, that the adjectives insane and deranged increasingly appeared um, uh, mixing in with these more vernacular uh, and traditional terms. <clears throat> and I think the reason we see, sorry about my video, I'll try to get back up, but <clears throat> I think the reason we see um, the, the harsher, we might say, words, um, uh, deranged and insane um, emerging in newspaper reports, et cetera, is that I think there was a rise of a Gothic sensibility uh, in the early 19th century um, that began to permeate the culture. For instance, we see the rise of sensational crime pa pamphlets um, replacing a sort of traditional comp compassionate models with more alarmist accounts of violently mad men and women. Well, let me take you to what I see as the kind of er intellectual text of this time period, and that is um, a medical treatise written by the Reverend Cotton Mather of Boston in the early 1700s. It was actually never published in his lifetime, but it was published later. The manuscript is found and is at the American Antiquarian Society. <clears throat> and I think he, he gives in the two chapters that I've put on the slide, <clears throat> He gives a good example of the advice that learned men of New England would have given to their uh, fellow settlers uh, when a loved one in your household fell into distraction. Uh, so you'll see the titles of two of his chapters, The Cure of Madness and The Cure of Melancholy. By cure, he means actually treatment. How do you approach it? People in this time period didn't usually use cure as meaning that you would completely um, uh, put your illness behind you. <clears throat> but the next slide has a really notable passage from Mather's uh, chapters that I want to read um, and, and really ask your, your, your thoughts is, do you think this is sort of like what we would call talk therapy? He writes, um, Tis not they that speak when someone is in a fit of distraction, tis their distemper. Their nonsense and folly must be borne with patience. We that are strong must bear the infirmities of the weak and with a patient, prudent, manly generosity, pity them and humor them like children and give none but good looks and good words unto them. We must bear one another's burdens or the burdens which we make for one another. So you're gonna see that I feel that some of what he's saying, which is sort of what's interesting is what he's not saying. He's not saying that we should intervene with um, uh, intrusive medical, uh, and he was actually trained as a physician or he trained himself as a physician um, interventions um, <clears throat> etc. He's really counseling patients here. And Mather, uh, like nearly all others in his culture, believed that people became or suffered from mental uh, illness um, by the providence of God. That's a phrase one sees over and over again in all sorts of records. Uh, and they believed that God, in his inscrutable ways, might lift a sufferer's despondency or the spell of madness. Um, in terms of causation uh, in this time period, um, Mather, like others, believed that there could be both natural and supernatural, meaning from God, um, uh, factors uh, behind someone's um, spell of mental trouble. Um, this is a time period when there are um, circulating medical ideas about <clears throat> the mind and the body, which they thought is very connected. Um, so what's happening with somebody's mind is often connected to what's happening in their physical body. Um, and so they often attributed mental distress to bodily causes, such as the imbalance of the four humors. This is a time period when that medical model is dominant. But they also started to talk about what medical historians call mechanical factors like the nerves. They didn't really understand the nerves quite the way we do, but they still began to use phrases um, uh, like nervous diseases or the, ner the nerves are affected. But let's remember 
that even with these bodily um, biological um, ideas, it, it, they believe God was overseeing or was all seeing in terms of what occurred in a person's body or soul. So next we're gonna look at practices. What is the sort of common repertoire of coping strategies and care? care? Um, and I just would mention four here. Uh, one is that if, if you are the sufferer, you are exempted from your normal duties and responsibilities um, if your illness doesn't permit you to uh, perform them. Um, and that's done in a sort of protective way um, but also a non-judgmental way. In other words, you're not blamed for not being able to um, fulfill your household functions or, or your job. Uh, <clears throat> so it's very important then to realize that distraction, as they put it, was an exculpatory or bracketing category. Second, as uh, Mather's advice indicated, watching and waiting were really the key chief responses. Uh, watching entailed um, the person's family and household members, uh, being sure that the afflicted person was adequately fed, clothed, uh, and not in danger. Uh, waiting meant being patient, as we've talked about, trusting that in time, both through the body's natural healing powers and through God's intervention, um, time would bring the afflicted person relief, uh, bring them back to themselves. And other home-based practices certainly were special prayers um, that accompanied the normal devotions um, of the household. Um, and also Mather himself recommended certain herbal uh, remedies. Um, I don't think people felt these remedies, whether they were tonics or plasters or would, would get rid of um, the change in the person's mental state, but might bring relief. So a major question that I pursue in my research is which of these two factors made more of a difference in white people's responses um, or, or really the bounds of their sympathy. Uh, I've argued that for the most part, whites are very sympathetic to other whites. Um, and um, uh, I first, when I started the project, I'm a historian of the law and of gender. I thought that uh, gender would be the major fault line and uh, that there would be a considerable difference between how uh, women who suffered from mental trouble were um, treated. Um, but I really find there's, there's, there's a lot of similarity in how white settler women were treated and how white set, settler men were treated. There's, there's a small kind of difference that we could talk about later, but it's only in rare cases. Um, so it's the racial fault line that's much, much more uh, evident in the records. Um, and there are two main types of evidence for this. The first is absence in the records. Um, that is, there are almost no references to distracted Native, Native and Indigenous people or persons of African descent prior to the 19th century. Now we know that New Englanders kept voluminous records. So, uh, so I think this is a striking absence. A second type of um, evidence comes from the suicide inquest that we find in every county um, in New England. Uh, we have pretty intact series of these. Um, so if one compares um, the verdicts that juries gave, um, in cases that they, where, they, where the community perceived a person had died by suicide, we see, um, first of all, just to remind you what the, what the blue headings are here, is that traditionally in England, um, juries had um, ruled that suicide, someone who, who died by suicide had committed self-murder, and in Latin, the phrase is fellow to say, taking your own life. Um, and that was seen as a really one of the most extreme sins that a Christian could commit because God was supposed to decide when you ended your life and you as a good Christian accepted that. You were resigned to when God decided death would come for you. Someone who could, died by suicide was usurping God's role. Um, 
And so these were punitive verdicts um, in the 15th, 16th century, um, and they often were um, led to profane burials where the person was not buried in this uh, churchyard, uh, but in a road, uh, and, and the, the personal property was taken by the crown. So they hurt, these verdicts hurt families. What we see in our period, the 18th century, is that both in England and most of the British colonies, there's a real shift in verdicts for, for people they perceive to be white. So if we just look at whites from the 1760 to 89 and these Massachusetts verdicts, we see this leap, right? Um, where far more people are given an alternative uh, verdict, <clears throat> non compus mentis, which was an exculpatory verdict that forgave you for dying by suicide because the idea was that you were in uh, an irrational uh, mental state. Um, and so there would be no punishment. Um, and it wasn't a negative verdict the way fellow to say was. But we, what we see in Massachusetts and Connecticut for uh, suicide verdicts for non whites. Indians and people of African descent is that there rarely do juries uh, rule non compus mentis. So, in other words, the fellow to say the punitive verdict persists. And let me kind of try to explain uh, why I think this is happening. Um, this evidence and some other evidence, I think, tells us that. Mental, the mental trouble and despair that were experienced by Blacks and Indians were, was largely invisible to whites. Um, they, they chose not to see it. They didn't see it. Um, they often saw instead in people of color behaviors they interpreted as willful, as voluntary. In other words, idleness, vagrancy, heathen depravity. Um, uh, and this approach meant that in practice across all New England jurisdictions, uh, the protection and compassion that was offered um, to mentally troubled people that I've talked about was reserved for white people. So that's a major argument in my project and my book. Now, this racial divide, which I feel is very important, um, could be the topic of a full talk. Um, but today, and I'm glad to talk about it in the Q&A, uh, but today I thought what I would do to sort of uh, make um, more concrete um, for all of you is to talk about two types of crises that could arrive, rise in people in, in New England communities as the consequence of a person's serious mental trouble. Uh, and I do want to stress that these are family tragedies, as you'll see, and they're not tip necessarily typical of people's encounter with mental illness. Um, uh, but I think they're important for us to analyze. So the first type of crisis that I'm going to discuss is something um, that, that nobody else has really discussed before. Um, and that is missing persons. Um, how this, this could come up um, in several ways, but just like today, in other words, family members panicked as we do if a household member left and did not return as expected. Um, so today we might think Amber Alerts. Um, what I'm really talking about is the 18th and 19th century version of this. So sometimes one gets glimpses of a, a crisis like this from guardianship records. In Connecticut, th those are called conservatorships. Um, but hundreds of adults across New England were adjudged uh, by a legal process um, to be non compus mentis and were put under the care of a guardian or a conservator. Um, and guardians were required to submit financial accounts of how they were spending their ward's resources for their, for their upkeep. And sometimes we see shorthand references, as in this case, from a guardian. Um, the man who had been put under guardianship was Moses Brown. He was 50 years old, uh, of Southampton, New Hampshire. And his guardian um, submitted expenses for, as you can see, twice, once in July of 1797, and then once the next year for self, meaning him, the guardian, going to a neighboring town, Rye, after Moses, meaning Moses had left where he was living, where he had been placed, 
Um, sometimes it's his own house and his wife is taking care of things. Um, and, and he'd walked to Rye, let's say. Um, and then in 1798, at some point, um, the Guardian uh, had to go to Salisbury, another town um, nearby, with a horse to retrieve Moses. Um, and he puts in uh, the costs. And, um, so it, it doesn't seem very dramatic from these financial accounts. Um, uh, but you can see that, um, that we might use other words, but wandering or walking or deciding to go explore uh, was something that happened and that, and that family members might panic because they didn't they didn't have advance warning. They hadn't. Um, uh, they didn't know if their loved one was safe. So for a long time in my research, I believed that the that these expense fragments were the only records we had narrating um, a, tr a mentally troubled person who wandered and and the difficulties that loved people loved ones had in finding and bringing them home. But a few years ago, however, I became aware that New Englanders began to use newspapers. Um, particularly from 1800 on, um, which I would call lost notices, but basically they're paying for ads um, to ask the public to help them find their missing loved one. Um, and so far I've found 55 examples um, by conducting keyword searches in the big digital newspaper database that we now have access to. And you can see that they start with a trickle in the 1770s and 1780s, and they gather steam in the 1810s and 20s. Uh, and that might be because newspapers proliferated in this early national period. They were published in more small towns than in New England, uh, especially Northern New England, Vermont and New Hampshire than ever before. So maybe this uptick in lost notices was because non-urban advertisers now felt that they had easy access to an affordable means of communicating across some distance that was more effective than word of mouth. So here are some of the headlines <clears throat> or banners that uh, advertisers chose for these lost notices. <clears throat> they didn't all have this sort of drama, but some of them did. You know, so they're trying to capture visually the attention of the newspaper reader. Right? Give heed, a lost son, a lost man. Another one read, <clears throat> left his place of abode. Distressing occurrence. And here's some actual examples. These are ones that don't have that sort of banner. Um, but this one um, that Thomas Kroll posted about his son, Joshua, has the basic formula, um, left his father's house, right? And the date, um, sorry, Thomas Kroll was the, was the person who left, um, a person insane. We see that word starting to be used more and more in the 1790s, about 40 years of age, in a poor habit, meaning his clothing, didn't have enough clothing for January and December. Um, any person who will give information where he may be found shall receive the thanks of his aged father. Um, and then they often added this kind of note to printers asking other printers. So, so Joshua Kroll has paid a small amount of money for this to run three weeks in a row in Spooner's Vermont Journal but he's actually asking other printers of newspapers to run it free, gratis, right? Out of the humanitarian concern for helping um, the parents and the, and the 40 year old Thomas be reunited. Here's one more um, that just underscores what I found when I did genealogical research on um, a large chunk of the 55 I was able to, add, to trace in other records. Barnabas Atwood was um, in his 20s, like the largest cluster of um, young men and, and the young women too um, in this sample. Um, and, and this one is longer as many of them were and described not just his physical appearance and clothing, but also some behavioral attributes. Uh, for example, he will run very fast when pursued. 
he has a great aversion to converse with people. And the ad also explains what was true in other cases, which is first, before they posted the newspaper ad, the family mobilized neighbors and friends for search parties. So they went out in, from the home in a kind of planned fashion to see if they could find if John was hiding behind a fence or in the woods or at somebody's house. And they used word of mouth um, to make great inquiry as, as this uh, ad says. It was only after weeks of no success using those methods that the parents typically resorted to uh, a newspaper notice. Um, I've been able to reconstruct um, a kind of timeline for Barnabas Atwood. Um, his parents lived in Carver, which is the place from which he left home in Massachusetts. Um, then, uh, so we know the date uh, because the father gave the date. Um, we know that the first notice in, in a newspaper was published on June 11th in, Bo in a Boston newspaper, which might indicate where. Um, the direction they thought the young man had gone. Um, and then June 28th, he, the father put a notice in, in a New Bedford uh, newspaper. Um, I don't have that on the map, but you all know it's uh, <clears throat> near the Rhode Island border. Um, and then in September, a third notice in Windsor, Vermont. Um, now, whether the family had had word, sightings, possible sightings, um, it suggests we at, at the very least, we know that Barnabas was gone for quite uh, several months. And we can imagine the distress of the father because the parents, because Barnabas was barefooted and barelegged when he left. Um, now it is summertime, but again, the emphasis is on not having adequate um, clothing and, and gear for a long journey. Now in this case, we, we have pretty good evidence that Barnabas was found and returned to his parents. We don't know how or when, but first a family genealogist states that Barnabas died in Carver, his hometown unmarried. And the censuses of 1800 and subsequently indicate he was present in his father's household. So we can, if we work hard at it, um, figure out outcomes for some of these 55 cases. Um, and I've just given you the 16 or so that I do know an outcome. You know, 13 indicate the person returned um, and perhaps led unremarkable lives. Again, we shouldn't think that they were, they suffered from mental health challenges for the rest of their lives. That wasn't necessarily the case. Two of the persons um, <clears throat> we know died. One was a five-year-old child who had left their uh, the parents' household, um, but it was in Boston, and the child had fallen into a privy vault and died in that way. Um, and the other death was a young mother in religious despair when she uh, left her household. She was found and, and returned home, but she soon afterward um, died by suicide. You know, one relocation, um, what I mean by that is the man evidently walked off and uh, started a new family in New Jersey, uh, eventually. So um, maybe that was uh, after nine, nine years. Um, uh, I mean, sorry, he, he ended up living the remaining nine years of his life in a New Jersey town and his wife and children only found out about that from his obituary. So of course this list doesn't answer the question of how many people re recovered their reason. I think many probably did. And um, Moses Andrews uh, of Vermont is an, is an example. He was a 41 year old farmer when he quote, left his house in a delirious turn and went into the woods as the newspaper notice said in April, 1793. Five weeks later, he was found in the woods and people declared at the time that he still remained crazy. Yet he recovered his reason sometime after this and returned to being a functioning householder. 
So I present those to you because I think they're gripping um, and because no one else has really discussed them. Um, and I'm still thinking through the patterns and, and trying to um, learn more about this type of notice in the newspaper and what it meant, what it means for our social and cultural histories. And I'd love to hear your ideas. <clears throat> The second time of, a type of crisis, which I'll go through quickly, um, arose when uh, violence accompanied a person's mental affliction. Um, and I'd want to remind us, we're going to talk about Salah Sheldon of Windsor, Connecticut, um, that there are aspects of uh, this very difficult time and he, he and his family is and his family life that these crises are both atypical and typical of how early American settlers lived with um, serious mental difficulty. The atypicality comes in the violence that is present. Uh, I assume that just like today, it's really only about 10% of instances where people suffer from some serious mental difficulty um, that they manifest violence towards themselves or towards someone else. Um, 90% of people suffering from mental and cognitive difficulties do not, do not become violent. But of course, at the same time, we're gonna see Sheldon's tribulations include more typical aspects of people's coping strategies. Um, so let's just look at a timeline. He, uh, Salah Sheldon was born in about 1753. We know he married at about 21, uh, no, 30. 31, um, Mary Drake in Windsor. They had four children born there. Uh, and the events that we're going to look at happened from 1786 to 1791. We know about these um, in some detail, not just because to give things away, um, Salal Sheldon was tried for murder, um, but because Charles Chauncey sitting on the Superior Court took detailed notes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, about the trial in the fall of 1791. There were no stenographers in court, so um, we often don't know what transpired in the courtroom. At, but Chauncey took 15 pages of notes um, on this, on witness testimony. So the testimony presents a picture of Salah and his wife Amy's life for the five years prior to the death um, of their infant. Um, and in these years, many observers said that Salah had lost his reasoning and was suffering greatly. These are also the years when the couple moved back and forth between Windsor and Suffield. Um, <clears throat> there's a kind of before and after picture in, in this trial as in many others. So before the witnesses said 1786, which they felt was a major turning point. He was sociable. Uh, he was a sociable young man. He managed his business well. He was kind uh, and tender to his family. Uh, he was a regular man, an active, kind, good man. But after, as some people said, he was taken crazy in late 1786, after moving to Suffield, he was often seen in a delirious state. When asked questions, he would not answer. He ran out of the house often and had to be caught, which links us to our other crisis. He would not sit to eat. He was extremely restless. He would take up sticks of wood as if to strike at people. He flung his Bible into the fire and he talked to himself a lot. So there were real difficulties um, in the fall of 1787. Um, uh, which I didn't put on the slide, but he, he jumped into a well uh, and, and didn't kill himself, but his head was bruised and he was bloody. Um, soon after that, he said he had thought to explain um, that incident. There were three or four people beckoning him to come to them in the well, which was a fine place. Then his season, his reason seemed to be restored briefly. Um, but some testified after that well incident, he never seemed to be the man he used to be. His memory was almost gone. He managed his business poorly. He often was a miss for liquor. So some of the things that Sheldon said in this four year, five year period, um, we get a sense of the pain, the type of pain and mental 
um, distress that he's experiencing. Um, if he ever um, did something outrageous, as the test, the witnesses said, he would say he wanted everybody to forgive him. He would whisper to his oldest uh, male child, can I endure to see you in such torment? He might say to his children, what misery you are in. And sometimes he referred obliquely to actions he might take. I will do it. And then he would say, I can't, I can't. Um, others felt that he was haunted to kill his children. Um, and we see here, I think, indications of religious despair, uh, which is what we often see in the few cases of familicide or um, parents um, being tempted, as they put it, or, or being moved to, to kill their children and put them out of what they saw as um, misery. It was but a short eternity, he said, in the days leading up to the death, as a kind of mantra. So he and his family moved back to Windsor in late summer of 1788, and his uh, disordered behavior became more acute. Um, his looks were wild and, and dis disheveled. Um, and um, I'm going to skip some of those details, but we have this amazing reconstruction of uh, where people lived um, in Windsor. And um, uh, he was living then with uh, in the house of his father-in-law, uh, Samuel Drake, um, to, to, the west, to the west of the center of Windsor. So I have the center of Windsor on the right side of the slide and where they lived on the left. And in fact, the small small house, um, not the one necessarily they lived in, but built by another Drake in Windsor survives. So it reminds us that the house in which um, these events occurred was probably a small, a modest one story affair. So precautions were taken in this case as they were in others like it. And that is the watch, a watch was put um, over the person, someone was designated to sit with Salah Sheldon literally every moment, day and night. Um, and of course, that's a tremendous burden um, on the household because it means two people can't be fulfilling their social and economic um, roles in the household. Someone has to be hired or a family member drafted. Um, this is, though, the watch, how New Englanders responded to people who seemed to be on the verge of injuring themselves or others. Um, as one woman put it later, um, Sheldon's wife, Amy, um, and the husband of um, someone else watched him for six months. Um, uh, and others uh, shared this duty too. One man named Pomeroy recalled that that winter I tended on him night and day for, for four weeks and he was crazy and attempted to kill himself. Um, so people would try to calm him. They would take a knife from him. Um, they were trying to give him pills, so that would be very interesting to know, is that laudanum um, or else, and he would he refused to eat them or take them. They tried a few uh, medical remedies, like a low diet. Um, we don't know what it consisted, consisted of. So the tragedy happened at sunrise on May 9th in 1791. Um, Sheldon killed his 16-month-old son, who was then lying in a cradle, uh, and he used an axe. And his nine-year-old boy was lying nearby, and he, was he received a grazing neck wound. Salah did not attempt to leave the, flee the scene. He was silent and pacing when neighbors arrived. Um, they pinioned him to a chair next to the table. Um, and the quote uh, tells us a little more about his mental state. So the community responses um, we hear in this testimony, many Windsor, Windsorites came by during that day or the next day to observe and query Sheldon. They would, they would ask him, how came you to kill that innocent babe? Uh, or they would ask him if he knew how had he done it? Um, and according to the testimony, they all judged him crazy or insensible or delirious or stupid or out of his head. Those are their phrases. Constantly groaning, making few answers or answering very slowly. So we see here, as in some other cases um, that I've come across, that 
the person suffering from a serious mental difficulty was a puzzle to observers, um, more so than most, most people um, that they perceived as um, suffering from mental illness, who were more predictable perhaps or followed a pattern. Um, and just make two final, I'm gonna make two final points about, the, about Salel Sheldon and his family. That first, Windsorites in the wake of the deed formed a consensus that Sheldon should not be hanged. Of course, he was put on trial for murder for his horrid deed. Indeed, they appear to have been accepting or at least resigned to his continuing to live in the town, uh, which he did for another 17 years after the murder. Um, he actually drowned in the Connecticut River um, in 1818, um, a long time after this. Um, there really was a, a, a local understanding that Sheldon in, had inherited a vulnerability um, to madness. Um, someone testified some of the family were crazy ever since I can remember and then mentioned grandmother Phelps, her father, her children. Um, so there are kind of mm, early ideas about madness running in families in this time period. We don't see it in every case at all, but we do see it sometimes. Um, there, there's the quote. Uh, but you'll see from my final slide that uh, Sheldon was indicted for murder, but upon trial in the Superior Court in, in uh, Hartford, the trial jury found him not guilty. Um, and that is on the basis of what lawyers call an insanity defense, or an insanity forgiveness, a mental health credit, uh, as we might better put it. As a newspaper said, there was no doubt that Sheldon killed the child, but it was fully proved that he was, at the time, uh, as he had been before the killing, insane. Um, and so we don't quite know. Sometimes in these cases, a seriously mentally ill person is remanded to the custody of their family or the town uh, to make sure uh, that they uh, are watched um, or do not commit more violence. Um, and we don't know that in this case, actually. So I'm just ending with um, some resources, um, a link to uh, the virtual uh, tour of the exhibit at the CHS, which I highly recommend. Um, I have written one uh, article from this project, uh, a case study of a, a man who lived in Barnstable. Um, but I also put down two books that I think are very good ones. Kim Nielsen's A Disability History of the U.S. is written for a general um, audience. It's not there's only one chapter in the colonial period, but it's really excellent. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I know that Jen is going to encourage me to answer questions. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. I'm going to um, open up the chat. If anyone has any questions, please feel to free to put them in the chat. I myself, am, I will put the link in the chat to our uh, virtual tour of Common Struggle Individual Experience as well. I know you put the link up there. Anybody have any questions? Uh, there was one early on, uh, Craig was asking uh, on the, the graph that you had of um, of the suicide, it was 33 a typo, he was asking. There was uh, one of the, I think that was the, the latest column, or, or excuse me, the latest row. Um, oh. Oh, go ahead, I, Craig. Thank you, Jen. Uh, I just noticed that that was the only number that wasn't, wasn't lower in the second column. It was the only number that wasn't lower than the first number. Well, I'm sorry, I don't have a printout here, uh, easily oh, that's available. Okay. So, I mean, you and I could talk about that later. I don't remember it being a typo, um, but <laughs> we'd have to. We'd no, have it's to just it was just because it, all, all the all the column in the second column they were mm -hmm. all lower numbers. That's all. It's not it's not crucial okay, at all. Okay, sorry, I'll, I'll reach out for sure. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. Well, what are the vapors? I see is one question. Uh, you know, and this is one of the. Uh, vernacular terms that people use not very often, but he was vapory or he seemed to have the vapors. I think we associate that more with the Victorian period. Maybe it became into more use. Um, again, I, I don't have a very satisfactory or specific answer to you. I think medical historians might have a better one, but I think this, this notion sometimes of the miasmas, the air can affect a person's uh, bo bodily health and also mental health. Um, 
So whether that's quite what they meant, I'm not sure. Um, uh, needs to be explored some more. And then Eileen talks about normal and not normal and, um, you know, uh, or being different. Um, and, you know, what's interesting, again, about this early period is that um, maybe fortunately for us, people are not using these categories of abnormal and normal. We might see them as an underlying, an underlining polarity. Um, but in a way that I think also contributes to um, the idea that there wasn't as much stigma um, and also that it, that whatever episode of mental difficulty you may have gone through didn't last for necessarily a long time. Um, so we could say perhaps there's more acceptance of, of difference or neurodiversity, I mean, that, that might be a stretch, but there, there, there's less mm, uh, snap judgment about it perhaps. Susan has a, a question. She's asking, does the idea of distraction indicated being distracted from something in particular or is it mm -hmm. distraction from their duty? Well, I read it as distraction from their the functioning brain in a way. You know, um, so um, in other work, I try to do more analysis of the of the spatial metaphors we saw. And you know, some of these are expressions are still with us, right? A person is not themselves, or a person is beside themselves. Um, and if you kind of pursue that cluster of phrases, um, I think of it as mentally, whether they did this or not, that in a way it's as if the head um, opened up and the person's proper thinking or personality um, went leaked out of them. So they sometimes use the, the, the language of leakage. Um, and uh, I would argue that the societal, settler societal aim is to contain it again, to recontain it, to, to bring integrity to the body and the mind. Um, and um, so I think that distraction means that your, you know, your mental capacity is, is not within you, it has leaked out. Catherine had a question. Um, she found your presentation very interesting, but she was wondering about, um, again, the data on the suicide. Um, could the willfulness White saw in African-American suicide have, in a sense, been like as an act of resistance, mm -hmm. some sort of Well, I think we would see it that way, for sure. Um, and uh, I didn't have a chance to look at it before I left, but Terry Snyder's wonderful book, uh, The Power to Die, uh, which is the first book to really analyze um, patterns of suicide in African Americans, particularly in the colonial period, early national period, particularly in the South, um, shows over and over again something I've seen in the New England newspaper reports that an African American person who takes their own life is often described as sullen and um, ba basically resistant. Um, it's as if, as if they're depriving, you know, uh, it's, it's not about their own pain or difficulties or active resistance, uh, defying um, their conditions of life and slavery. It's as if um, they're kind of sullenly, childishly taking themselves away from the person who's superior to them can command their labor. Interesting. There's... Uh Janelle has a question that she's saying she was surprised to hear that early New Englanders didn't blame people for their mental illness. She had heard that there was a time in early New England when disability was viewed as punishment for the sins of the parent or parent of the disabled. Do you know if this was a different time period than colonial time period you're discussing uh -huh. now or a due to a distinction? Right. No, it's a good question. Um, some, some scholars have argued that. Um, I would say that uh, we would see more references. We see more references to um, perhaps linking a person's mental difficulties to um, their vices or um, to Satan um, kind of tempting them to um, not be good Christians and, and therefore God is punishing them uh, through uh, mental affliction. We see more of that in the early and mid 17th century. 
Um, and I see almost none of that kind of blaming um, from 1690 onward. Um, so again, you know, it's hard to argue from absence, but uh, that's, um, that's what I find. I, I, I really find none of that kind of thinking uh, in the 18th century and afterwards. Interesting. Um, okay, what, another question. What were the small differences in the way settler people were treated based on gender? All right, thank you for that question, Susan. I mean, I, you know, there's one chapter in my book called something like disorderly women. So in other words, I would, I find some cases, not many, where the community is divided on was a particular woman who was acting in what they saw as outrageous ways, was, was, was she to be forgiven for those because she suffered from serious mental trouble and therefore she should be exempted from responsibility or was she willful and sort of deliberately acting that way? And this is the case that actually started uh, my project, which is a divorce case I read for my first book between Samuel and I think it's Lydia Brockway in Connecticut, where the, the, he wanted a divorce because his wife had behaved, he felt outrageously, and the neighbors were really divided. So my argument here is, in the end, the court argued he could have his divorce. Um, um, and they sided with the neighbors who said she was pretending to be mad. Um, she was feigning madness, um, basically acting out um, as a resistant wife. And therefore, she was left with nothing, right? If, if, if you were the guilty party and a woman in the divorce, you got no alimony, no child support, no, uh, we don't know what happened to her. Um, uh, but if, she, if, the, if the judges had agreed that she was mentally ill, uh, he could not have had his divorce. That was not a, a reasonable ground for divorce. So it's, I guess what I'm saying is that the margins of, or in some cases, women are uh, receive a punitive verdict, but it's of not mad. You know, we think in the Victorian period, women were incarcerated wrongfully by their husbands, which is the case, um, as if they were mad. Um, but here, it's to, it's to be found not mad for white women that is um, particularly harsh. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Lots of comments, uh, but just really uh, the compassion and understanding at this time of colonial uh, people is really quite remarkable. Kitty's commenting. This is very interesting conversation for sure. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you to everyone. Anyone else? Any questions? Uh, Janelle is asking the name of the woman in the divorce case that you just Well, mentioned. you know, I'm forgetting her first name. Um, the last name was Brockway, uh, and I'm pretty sure the husband was Samuel, and I can't remember if she's Lydia or... So it's in my book, Women Before the Bar. But if you email me, I will find out what it, what it was. I'm sorry that I'm forgetting. Uh, and to, to, can you remind everyone the name of your book? Oh, yes, right. Let me put, uh, yes, it's um, Women Before the Bar, Gender Law and Society in Connecticut. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, okay, so Susan's uh, mentioning Elizabeth Tuttle. Um, Jonathan Edwards' grandmother and the divorce and distraction did come up there as well. It did, yeah. Well, <laughs> Ava uh, Chamberlain has written a wonderful book on um, those, those issues, how mental illnesses, we might say, ran through the Tuttle family. It's very pronounced um, in some of the siblings. Um, and so it's an important case study. And I would recommend her book, which I'm forgetting, uh, I'm forgetting, oh, sorry, the, the name of the book, but it's an excellent uh, micro history. Ah, I can't type today. <laughs> there we go. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Great, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Before we uh, end our time together today. I just wanted to mention our next uh, Lunch and Learn and a few other events that we have 
coming up. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen for a minute. Uh, June 11th is a very busy day. In the morning, we do have a, uh, a public reading with Bao Fi at about uh, Asian American voices, and he is the author of two children's books um, called Upon Different and um, My Footprints. And Upon Different uh, re really won many awards, including a Caldecott honor. So it's really going to be an interesting conversation. And also that day we have our behind the scenes tour black history at the chs it's offered at 11 and at 2 p.m and we will really get to look at some items from our collection that represent the spectrum of the black experience in connecticut and then our next lunch and learn is june 14th at noon elena rosario a phd candidate will be talking about social and cultural expressions of puerto rican settlement in post-war Hartford by really examining some historical moments and cultural events uh, around that. So we hope you will join us.